Thanks, everybody. Um, so let me just see a quick show of hands. How many of you are not Southern Pleasanton? Okay, so for you folks, this might be a very odd evening. All right, I'm just going to apologize. Uh, this is primarily geared towards draft playing, summer playing. It's very informational for them. But I promise to tell you know, a handful of jokes about the movie involved or this game would be something like that that hopefully keep you interested and will keep you from not doing it. So, uh, anyway, uh, I am Dr. Matson. I teach trumpet at Utah State, as I'm about to say. Uh, it's very nice to be with you guys today. We'll do whatever that happened to me earlier in here tonight. My plan for this evening is to uh, explore some extended techniques of trumpet. And the reason why I kind of set off on this little journey is that we don't want to learn more about the techniques is because of one thing in particular. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Florida, there was a, a person who came and gave a recital, and uh, very similar to this kind of environment right here. He, he played a piece called Thrill by Robert Harrison, and his piece uh, kind of shocked me because he was doing all sorts of things on trumpet that I wasn't really quite used to. He was swinging and playing at the same time. The trumpet was being taken apart, he was playing in the house, that kind of thing. He was sitting in pocket and playing, there was information things I never really quite heard. So, nevertheless, I was really excited about this piece. So, when I started my graduate work, I made a goal of mine find that piece and perform it. So me, being a proud trumpet player, I'm a very proud guy. I, I got this piece and started to work on it for my recital, which was in you know, so a few months after I got the piece. And needless to say, I failed on it. But not much this thing. It's getting way too hard for me. For something that sounded on the receiving end, if you could put it into a piece, totally kick my butt. There was nothing I could do. With every measure, there was something I could not do on the time. And eventually, I got trusted it. But months after my graduate degree, I just decided that, you know what? I don't like anyone to take my, my little perfect piece like that. So I'm like, I'm going yeah, to figure this out. I'm going to discover everything I can about certain techniques and practicing things so that if I ever encounter a piece like that, I'm going to be able to explain it from the shop. Okay. So the first thing I did was I, I went to New York and cycled it and cycled two years of music, and I realized that I don't want to be. What you guys can see. For those of you who study music and hear what we want to do, um, anyone here for deep growth encyclopedias? Kind of? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Ish. Okay. All right. So, we grow for me when I was in school, or at least what I had access to, was the primary source for the general information about all the things we do. So, I looked up trumpet extended techniques, extended techniques in the trumpet industry. What I found was a bit disappointing. The first thing that I found was uh, the first thing they were only three. The first thing they had in there was the use of different roots, such as the raw rock or the plunger or the river, which isn't really extended. But the big band, we've already done that kind of thing. That kind of part of the course. I think we do The second thing they said was the use of incorrect or long mouth pieces, which is also incorrect. It's odd. You haven't heard of that. Third thing, which I actually agree with, is the, uh, they say the, the alteration of the trumpet, altering the structure of the instrument, like unscrewing the valves and pulling out the slot, right? I think we could have that to be a good example. So, since there was such a tremendous lack of information, I dealt into other sources, called the Global Times that I happen to know, and uh, asked for some information about what's extended, what's out there, what do you know that's happening? And uh, I learned a couple of things right off of that. First of all, there are pieces being written for trumpet. That you have to actually use different kinds of wine bottles and extend it or put different wine bottles in the bag. Different kinds of wine bottles. Bordeaux, Merlot, that kind of thing. So, something else I'm researching in the language a lot. Um, so, Bordeaux, Merlot, those different kinds of bottles. Also, um, uh, playing the trumpet inside a tent, full on stage. Trumpet quartet inside a tent, full on stage, like this. But also, um, Playing the trumpet with the bell submerged with water. And I know it's not trumpet related, but there's also a violin for that that's supposed to be played while hovering the mic. Four helicopters, four players, big bugger, and some friends that are high. All right. So uh, that's kind of what started my, my journey in this. I kind of found a lot of things out right off the bat that sparked my interest in the war. So um, what I did is I whittled everything down just to a set of categories for us tonight. In the next four and a half hours, I will walk you through each of them. Yes, you are. Stay with me. So, all right. Um, 
So uh, there's a few pieces I'm going to use this evening. Solus by Stan Friedman is one of them. Krill by Robert Erickson, which is the same piece I told you about that hit my butt earlier. Six Rings of Thin by Luciano Barrio, which is a, uh, I consider that to be the Mars piece of music with the puppet currently. Um, also, um, Invisible Music by Argentinian composer Cecilia Barbera. And I'm going to have some new examples for you. And if anyone here have a couple, Anybody bring a horn? You guys are horn last week. Mm -hmm. We do. Oh, trumpets. Okay. All right. Yeah, just, just good to get to know. I might have you try something if you're okay with it. So, if not, I can just keep plowing through. So, without further ado, let's get started, guys. So, y'all should have a handout. Um, I'm going to start with page three. I'm going to start talking about some things that aren't really that new, that extended, but I can see them as a kind of borderline. Extended techniques. The first thing I'm going to talk about is flutter coming. Flutter coming is pretty simple. It's a pretty simple technique for one of these methods. It's in Spanish still, where you lower your R and play. So. Flutter coming. Rolling your R and play. So, there are some people who can't actually roll their R's. How many people know they're not rolling their R's? Anybody who's not going to roll their R's? Yeah, okay. I was one of them too. So, what I learned, like I said, I'm a very quiet photographer. What I learned that you can actually overcome this. You can actually back it and start to roll with cars in most cases. So, um, what I was, what I did one day, I was driving actually on my way to work. And I used to drive a little bit of a Anybody seen those cars? The kind of box, tubes for the windshield, the right up in your face? You know? So, you know, the driving to work. And thinking, all right, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out right now. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. Spinning all over my windshield. <laughs> Eventually. And then I have it. It just took about 10 minutes of practice. I convinced myself I'm going to do this. I kind of train myself to relax in the technique that you kind of Now, there are some people that will struggle, that can struggle for years if they're doing that hard with the genetic efficiency. How many of you have ever looked at me and maybe you've been at a party or something and have a few of the you look at yourself in the mirror and you look at your tongue off and you're not looking? Uh, you look behind your tongue. Can you see that little flat on the ceiling? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Good. Good minutes. All right. Cool. Okay. That clap of skin is called the frame. Frame. Okay. Sometimes, if your frame is really, really short and really, really tight, like a ball almost. Okay. Good. Okay. So, yeah, if that's really tight like a ball, then um, sometimes you can't roll your arms. A short frame can kind of be there. Now, what you may not know is that any general practitioner, any, any general um, family doctor can actually take a pair of scissors and snip that for you. And actually cut that very well so that you can roll your arms, and also you can stick your tongue out very far. So, if you have a problem rolling your arms and you can't figure it out on your own, you want to ask your doctor to help you out if you can do that kind of thing. Okay? All right, by the way, I know this is trumpet related, but for anybody in here, trumpet player, if you have not have any questions for me about what you're hearing, what I'm saying, if you want to argue with me, you can say something. Please raise your hand. That question is only for this one. Um, next technique <clears throat> uh, doodle coming. It's a story that I think that's your category. Doodle coming, this is going to be from our trumpet player friend, the grass player friend. Doodle coming is like very similar to, to double coming, except the rebound, where the coup syllable would be, you actually have O. Oh, do do do. So instead of double coming, okay. That's double coming. Where this technique was really developed and really fun was uh, was actually our jazz trombone playing. So how many people here play jazz? You see jazz players here? They beat off a little bit, some people? Ish, okay. All right. So some role players, they can't play, well, sometimes they can. They have, they have a hard time playing pretty rapid passages sometimes. 
what they developed in order to be able to hang out with the saxophone players and the players in terms of bebop, jazz level, uh, they developed doodle drum. This is kind of their textbook. They brought this forward and then modified it. Uh, well, a good textbook to use for those of you who want to know more about doodle drum. Is Bob McChesney with doodle drum? Oh, uh, let's look at that. Bob McChesney means doodle uh, studies and etudes for slide trombone. Also, Conrad Herbert has some PDFs on that. Conrad Herbert. Now, there is a trumpet player that actually um, uh, really, really uses, the, uses this technique very well, and it's Clark Perry. Hopefully, all of you here are musicians have heard of Clark Perry. This is some of his uh, <coughs> a solo on uh, Top of the Tale on the record memories of the, hopefully, my little bow speaker. Just imagine that that's not a good thing. Okay. So, any questions so far about articulation? Not so bad, right? Nothing really too weird yet. So, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is on page five. We're going to talk about pedal tones. Now, pedal tones are defined uh, by Willie Apple in the Harvard Dictionary of Music as false tones existing beneath the lowest true tone produced by the entire length of the pipe. For some players, that's not actually F sharp. That's actually a little F. You think the third option that I'm going to go? On the same trumpet, that's a little F. Beneath that, you're going to get into the pedal register. Okay, where notes aren't really much, they're false notes. And so forth. Those are called pedal tones. I'm sure most of you guys have already kind of experimented with these things or learned about them. How many of you actually kind of start from the front books? How many of you? Good. What? So there's a lot of books, a lot of pedagogical reference materials for you to check out if you want to use pedal tones. We're here to hand out uh, James Thompson's The Bundle Book, uh, Jimmy Stamps, Almost and Studies, uh, The Loose Mondial System, and also the Systematic Approach to Daily Practice by Clark Wood. They're all over the place in the pedagogical material for us to develop range and power. Now, uh, looking ahead, you can look at that example and see it's located in two different ways. You see a note that's a bass clap, a B flat to the one, or sometimes you'll see it in shuffle clap for an octave indicated key. All right? Uh, some quotes. This is from David Hickman, professor of trumpet at Arizona State University. While uh, often used in concert music, pedal tones have performed very popular methods in methods designed to increase range and power. Okay? Agree? I agree with that. Next. This is from Keith Johnson's Art of Trumpet Play. This is something I actually disagree with. Pedal tones are, unfortunately, only exercises. Their musical value is virtually zero. And lacking any musical interest, they can become quickly or quickly become boring and making thoughtless playing. I actually have to disagree with that. As you can see, this to me, the ear is the end of Samuel Friedman's solace. Oh, <laughs> All right, they're okay. You got good. Yeah. Good report. <laughs> so now, this is when things are going to get a bit uncomfortable in here because we're going to talk about microtonality. Microtonality. The definition of this is just the use of intervals smaller or of less than the equally spaced same. So. You can find these located in Thurl and Robert Erickson, also some uh, uh, stock thousand eight feet, and uh, some jazz trumpeting by Tomorrow Stanko and Arnold Hamilton. So there's not really a notation system in Western that actually works for this. You actually have to be creative. You see these notes with the arrows pointing up and down, letting you know that these notes are supposed to be not really quite similar to our Western music. So here at the bottom of page six, 
I'm going to play this passage without microphone swimming. Just so you can just let it sound like it's having a dramatic passage. Then I'm going to add some microphones in there, let you guys get just what this actually sounds like. So here is a little bit of there, uh, Harrison's crew, the piece that I struggled with early on in my career. Uh, and here is just one, one bar of this. So here you go. No microphone. Left. B natural, the second note, instead of what we're going to do is this. Kind of burned, right? Well, those are West Memorization, you can't sound out of tune. You want to fix that one. No, it's supposed to stay there. Here's the passage with microphone. Hurts, hurts me a little bit. I want to lift those notes up and down and kind of put them where they're supposed to go, but you can't do that. You have to let it go and let them be out of tune. Okay. Now we're going to move ahead to uh, sitting in pocket with the trumpet, page seven. Uh, this is a pretty simple technique. Now, who, how many people here have had music history? Good. Yeah, good. Okay. What's a hop here? <laughs> Okay, well, let me help you. So, pocket, center, hiccup. From some of my Renaissance era brothers and sisters, if it's sing, what would happen with the two singers and they would alternate rest and sing with each other. So, ooh, 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 ooh. They would kind of go back and forth on a specific line. Pocket plus pickup. All right? For my end of things, for the trumpet, what you actually do, you sing and play back and forth with the trumpet. So if you look at the notation on the page, there's a little example. You see the X on the line of this space, you just want to sing. And the notes that look normal are where you actually play. So um, what I'm going to go ahead and do now is kind of the same passage I just played for you with microphones, but I'm going to actually include just a couple of notes where you sing and walk it with the trumpet. So here's the same passage right there in the middle on page seven and a couple of extra things. So, for those of you who are trouble players in here, and I won't have you try anything, but for those of you who want to practice this, there's actually benefit in this. So, if I just play a uh, 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 C major arpeggio, a C in a pocket with the trumpet, there's some good things that happen. So, instead of, if I sing a second note, uh, 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 if I just play with that for a few minutes, what actually happens is my face really relaxes. My cheeks kind of fall apart. My chops get loose. So when a piece that's like hard, the microphone, you're really tight, and you're trying to play the right thing, singing in pocket and playing help me kind of unlock. That kind of cause me to relax. So for those of you who are playing quarks, how many of you play quarks by these hopefully? Or we have a non trumpet player in here. You don't even play the trumpet. Should be playing quarks by these So. How many of you will play parts of it? If you take those, just experiment again. If you sing in pocket, pick a note, the lowest note, the slowest note, the highest note, the highest note, watch what happens to your friends. Watch what happens to your job. I guarantee you you're going to be a little bit more than that. Not sure if you're going to sound better. But you'll be a little bit more relaxing. So, moving on. Any questions so far? Staying in pocket and playing with the trumpet. You find some quite a bit of the uh, newer kind of contemporary challenges of the show. So, be ready for that.
Now, next, uh, we're going to move on to slide to assignment. Pretty simple technique here. All it is is a chunk of temporary that takes on the form of a trombone. I know it's not that cool, but it happens to me. So if you look at uh, this excerpt by Sam uh, Friedman, um, and also, yeah, this is actually from Sam Friedman. If you look down there, what you do is you alternate finger A notes and you use your third drop slide or your first drop slide and that's kind of a trouble in the slide. So, Trumpet has to work well. Your slides have to work well for this to be an option. If you're one of those jokers that don't, you don't clean your trumpet, your slides don't move. Yeah. Shame on you. Get your mark fixed. First of all, second of all, when that's done, you can probably try some of those Notation wise, there's not really a, a, a great way to do it. You see there at the bottom of page seven, you'll see that the third valve, the rail point out, or in. Kind of lets you know if the slides out in, or if it goes out and in. Or sometimes it'll give you a valve indicator. And like a sear of the line, so you're supposed to eventually slide up the first album. So, here is an excerpt of Stan Friedman's Swellless. Before I do this, I should probably explain something about this piece. Uh, did anyone here know this piece by Stan Friedman's Swellless? Okay. Good. All right. So, what you should know uh, this piece is a four movement that's supposed to be kind of the story of a very serious trouble player. They gradually go into it. He gradually moves and he gradually succumbs to a bout with schizophrenia. The end of the piece is some people think the player dies, some people think he just got some sanity going to put. But um, first movement is a very serious movement. It's pretty much a straight 12 tone movement. Uh, with a little bit of extended tech release, the player is still there. It's in fact very serious. The second move, we start hearing other voices. We start hearing other things kind of keeping in the way. Third movement, he's more insane, and he's hearing things like, you know, you would be part of the movements. Um, other things, the rules of this movement are screaming in some way. Fourth movement, there's a cloud straight on the top, it's the plane. There's fanfares from a different person in the business. So, at least in his mind, it's a different person that we're by the side of the house. So, this with some slides on the Here's just a little bit of the first movie of Stan Friedman. This is in the trouble player's house, so it's still kind of happening together. Next, uh, I'm going to talk about page number six. This is my next topic. So, um, number six, it's that uh, all the structure of the instrument. There's some examples we'll have as removal of the slides, unscrewing the valve caps, or moderately extending some of your slides to reach microphones. So, this example at the bottom of page P is uh, where we're removing a slide here. What will make so much? Which one that's that? The one that the beginning is just the end of the So this is just the first three lines of the first of the fourth group of uh, three new songs. Hmm. No second outside. Double two outside. heard by a man who is dealing with the other thing. Okay? Making sense a little bit? Yeah? All right. So, moving forward, we're going to revisit Erickson's girl. Now, just so you get the gist of how hard this thing was, this is just the first, this is actually a, a chunk of the music in the second line. It's a 15-page it's a book. This is the second line. 
I'm going to play the same chop now, unscoring my valves. So you get valve rhythms. That have that payoff and that payoff and the palette sound. Clicking as I'm playing microphones, singing in pocket, and then adding a second dot on the side. A lot of the same techniques for the upper notes. Side. My wife is a pianist. She has her pitch. She's a really great concert pianist. And when I started practicing this in our house, it didn't take, it, you know, it didn't take very long for me to basically have to start practicing this. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of challenging. It's not the best singer in the So, moving on, guys. So, number seven. Theatrics. I wanted to find some, some kind of heading for some of these things that I was finding. Um, this is, uh, I just called this additional dramatic elements introduced for or by the trumpeter to enhance the composer's intention, tenor, audio, and score. We find this part of it in primarily stock houses music and standard music. So, how many of you here have heard about Carl Pine's stock album, one of the symphony composers, they came along? Okay, all of you, please remember this day. If you really want a weird afternoon, I need a weird afternoon. Go look up some YouTube videos of Carl Hines stock albums on the wrong side. An instrumental opera that you want. It's an opera with trumpet players come on there walking around on stage and you're kind of inspired to come to the same thing. Contemporary dance, contemporary, you know, I mean, bodily expression, people walking on stage and acting like they're pulling their face apart while you're doing some of the hardest repertoire on trumpet ever created. Carl Hines stock album, light side. Trust me. It's weird, you'll remember it. So, his son, though, Marcus Stockhausen, is a world class trumpet virtuoso. Great improviser, yoga master. Uh, I mean, he does everything well, but his trumpet playing is his is top notch. He makes it more, he can play anything he wants to do. His dad was very much a very challenging, he was a very challenging music for the audience and the player. Anyway, back to the record. Um, if you look at this chunk on page nine, I'm not going to play this for you now because it's going to come up when I play the second, third, or fourth movement of the piece later for you. But you can see there, the composer has a bracket that extends over the top line. It's like seven seconds, and you have some kind of improvisatory figures written in all of it. Beneath that, you have 10 seconds written in that line, but you just have a circle of this, and then you have some things you're supposed to kind of start the album. Nothing in particular, you're supposed to start from the each album. We're getting more and more cranking, more and more insane. So, if you play this thing really ridiculously square, it doesn't really quite, I mean, it's supposed to be a guy going crazy. You know? So, if you play it square like a shy sixth grader, it's not really the same kind of effect that this guy has on the group. So, some theatrical skill, some theatrical skill is something you probably should consider to be able to do this. So, this is a quote from Doug Foster, who's the principal from the Rochester Philharmonic. When I perform this section, there's a little bit of freedom. I imagine Trump player struggling with a particular passage of Pakistan. Trump player grows more and more angry and begins to shout. So, having a bad day in the crowd is showing a bad day in general. You start getting mad, you try to talk to everybody, you work out, ah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, we're going to the same context for this thing. So, let's put it on stairs and see. Moving forward, please, then. So, um, these photos are from a few pieces from Stock Island Light Cycle that I was just talking about. The four photos at the top half of the page, this is from a piece called Trumpet Tent. Um, if you look, there's a tent on stage, and there are four trumpet players playing inside the tent. They're playing bigger on the they're playing B5 trumpet, B5 and C. If you look at the bottom left hand corner of that piece of four, you'll see the trumpet player standing side by side with his music glued to the tape inside the wall of the tent. Whatever way we can make it happen, I think we can turn very much improvised. On the right side, you see them standing with the right foot over the left foot of the person to the right. Why they do that for the group is so they can keep the center while they're playing inside the center. They can't see each other because there's no conductor. It's a chamber piece. Why they do that is to keep the center. 
Folks, this music is ridiculously challenging. Nothing. If I was going to perform that with three of the really percussion drum players, I would have been in rehearsals twice because it's that challenging. The thing about the drum parts is playing A is about B and all that C and B. Piano from the shape you It's ridiculously challenging stuff. The guy I played the was Marcus Stockhouse, and that's why he could write stuff. So, guys, this is extended. This is probably as extended as it gets. So, aside from Stockhouse, uh, Carl Hunt, the composer, uh, if you wanted this to be a recital piece, if you wanted to find this published, what you were supposed to do is put the tent on stage. Like if I was going to play in here and have cover tent later, it would be back there the whole time, the whole recital. And the goal was to make you all question. Huh. So it's time to play the piece that's no one on stage and suddenly the public four takes out from behind the tent and plays a bit. Cover three, keep on all the big legs. Take left, cover two, cover one, come to the back of the hall. Gradually you start moving around the hall as a group. The end of the piece, you all go inside the tent and play this ridiculously hard music from the cover track. That's cover ten, you can find the video, check it out. Those of you who are really ridiculous and brave, you will punish yourself and run this as a trumpet tip. Alright, questions so far? I'm talking with time. No one's being too talking to God. So, anybody have any questions? Anything you want to bring up? No? Alright, so just beneath that, just for your reference, uh, this is a photo. There's a few photos from uh, Stock Out's Dragon Flight, which is also the light cycle. Uh, the bottom left hand corner is a root belt which he made in rubber for his own use, so he can actually have roots with him while he was the leading actor or character of his opera. On the right, there's a picture of Martha Scott House on the cancer. So, root belt is like, kind of a cool thing. I guess I wouldn't wear it in public, just it would be a serious risk of doing it and you know, that's not cool. So, yeah. And in the light cycle, if you're an actor, you got root belt, fair game. Okay, moving on, page eight, or I'm sorry, page 11. Multiphonic symbols of this is multiple, probably kind of multiphonics, right? Okay. You're playing another the trumpet, you're singing another the of three years. Sometimes people can sing below, I'm not one of those people, I struggle with this kind of thing. But people usually sing above. So for me, I've read a pedal bone B and sing a major third of the back to a kind of a chord. So bear with me for my mind, so I'm going can you hear that record one more time? So, this is a technique that our some old friends have wrote down and all credit just for Google for me. The reason for that is it's easier on, on instruments that are lower tested than a couple of two but multi parts and lay down the ball. Something that's more challenging because our guys are very tough on the high. So when we try to play this, we have to go to the sixth high, the big thing is the high or the medium of the high. So you do find this in some of the pieces out there that are piece by Hans Herbert, called exposed for it, which are they used in the uh the fire feature and also a slip competition, I believe in 2004. So there are pieces out there that are required for us to learn competitions and want this technique to be done by the There it is. Thank you. Multiple parts. Okay, so this is where things are getting even more uncomfortable. We're going to talk about shredding or split tones or just purposeful distortion. What I define this is I just call it obsessed tension inside the cup of the mountains so that creates a shredded or tearing like tone. Or, or split tones or two parts of the herd at the same time. So, this is usually what some of the dang dance students get when you try to fix it. So, check this out. This is, I'm going to try to do it so you can see. So uh, that's my example of it. There are people that do this very, very well. They can do this very, very artistically. One person I want to bring to your attention is a jazz trumpet player. 
pelo qual o Luther formou desde o início de cada conferência. Fiz a minha foto lá para uma referência com o professor, para os pessoal mesmo da World Class B-Rock Player, foi feito por Digital Jazz, mas ele também foi feito por outras coisas que eu gosto de fazer. Let me find a recording of this and we'll do a question here. It sounds like it's really kind of a shred of art, like you're using some kind of pedal for the source of the pedal. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Some of the mix, but the color he gives blends perfectly with the tune. So here we go. Here's some of the way. This player's name is Arma Hanson. This is from his cartography record called Poverty and His Opposite. This is a trumpet record. This is a trumpet record. Thank you. 
Besides, besides mutes or electronics. So, um, use of the piano, water, wine bottles, like I said earlier, and other items that act as a way to alter or enhance the proper performance. So, this is a little bit of stock house and stock house. Very is sequenza 10. Now, I need a volunteer, maybe a musician in here, one of you, to come up with this. Yeah, just sit there and hold the piano for the hell Anybody? Volunteer. It's not our guys, just no, no. Yeah, come on. Thank you. So you'll see why I wanted you to sit close. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play. Well, to look at this excerpt, you'll see there's little arrows that point down on some of the notes. Maybe, um, yeah, the first note on the second line. That is what I'm going to play. the piano while someone is pushing down the sustain. Okay, so let me see if you don't look at the part. I'm just play a little bit. This is what it sounds like without that thing in your heart. This is a very booming room, so hopefully you get the distance to what it is without the water on it. Okay. Closely, for some of you are sitting kind of further back, this is most specifically the camera. And as a whole new element, 
supposed to happen is it kind of ceases to become a trumpet. It becomes like this midway kind of half nature, half the trumpet. The instrument is supposed to be in the music. That's a lot of poetry really kind of crammed in a nutshell for it. So there you go. So if you look at the page you there's a couple of techniques there. There's four of them. There's one where the bell is kind of submerged in one. There's another one where the bell is punching the top of the water. There's another one where the bell is in out. And the last one of the bells will be in the So, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and just play the first movement of this piece for you. It's a very short piece. So, this is called Invisible Music 4 by Cecilia Arden.
It's, it's odd, but I just did. I'm about to stick my bell and water in play, but I just don't think my spill. Why? Why don't I just do that? Yeah. 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 You know, something that she, that it's kind of a, it's almost a theater because this, ideally, if we did this exactly by her instructions, what you would get is a strong beam of light, boom, right here in the middle of the stage, in a fully black stage. And this would actually be a large metal pen on it. And I would play into the pen like that. And while the, while the light is hitting the water, you would feel this too bit, but you'd also see on the ceiling and see ripples and that kind of thing. Which is pretty cool with that. But one thing she didn't consider is that all guys like myself would try to play this piece. And if I'm bending down like this and there's light bouncing back up, it's at about top of my head, right back at you guys. So, probably not going to do it. Probably not going to do it. So, all right. Let's keep, keep going. Oh, cool. Now I'll get the third one. So, I'm just going to play the second, third, and fourth movement of Stan Green and Silver. So, this is a review. What this is, it's the gradual unraveling unravel of a cover player dealing with certain things. I'm going to start with the second movement where things are becoming interesting. We'll be starting here for other places. Third movement, he's even crazier. He visits a, a wild, just kind of a waltz carnival esque kind of place, creepy carnival. You know, we'll hear that. Uh, and then he kind of loses his pool and he gets flushed in. Fourth movement will be a spot out to be Okay, and feeling it to be. So anyway, this is it. This is the second and third movement of Stan Freed and Souls. Hope you enjoy it.